my life was over. Everything I'd worked for was gone. The, the trains crashed and I lost my face from my top lip upwards. Oh my God. I can still remember the pain to this day. Imagine being in a train crash and having your entire face ripped off. That's extremely shocking, but somebody that can turn around and say that they're grateful for what's happened to them. Yep, that was fun and I made a difference. The train crash is actually the best thing to have ever happened to me. Welcome back to another episode here at Turning Your Adversity into an Asset with Lewis Raymond Taylor. Today, as always, we've got a very inspirational person and we like to share inspirational stories of people that have been able to do exactly that, turn their adversity into an asset. And Pam Warren that we have here today is uh, no different than any of our other guests. They have all have incredible stories but very unique stories and stories that if more people had access to, they would realize that there really is so much opportunity in life. And, you know, all these tough things that happen to us aren't necessarily the end of the road. So before I rattle on, I'm just going to hand things over. First of all, Pam, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hi, Lewis. Uh, yeah, no, I'm doing great. Thank you. And thank you for having me on your show. Very honored. No problem at all. It's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. So I think we should just get straight into it with tell us your story because it's, uh, it's an incredible one and even you've, you've, you've achieved a lot since, which I can't wait to dive into as well. Yeah, right back where it started, I guess. Well, yes. I mean, I used to be a financial advisor. Um, <laughs> that was what I did for a living and I had my own company and it was doing very well, thank you. And I was just minding my own business, catching a train into London my high speed train that was coming through Reading um, crashed, met a train coming out of Paddington um, and we were on the same bit of line and our train was going at over 130 miles an hour. They hit head on. I was in the carriage just behind the engine. Oh, it, it was, yeah, even now it's in shivers. It was, it was decades ago. It was 20 one years ago now, but it still sent shivers. <laughs> wow. um, but anyway, the, the trains crashed and the fuel in the engines, fuel tanks ignited. A fireball came straight down my carriage. But most of us um, to a crisp, basically. Wow. And unfortunately, 31 people did die from both trains. Wow. And I should have been the 32nd when I eventually got taken to hospital. I, I, I was completely in a coma by then. Um, my family were told not to expect me to survive. Um, so they had to live with that. For me, it was more, um, I was unconscious in a coma for three and a half weeks. So I really had no idea what had happened or what was going on. Although my memory and stuff began obviously to come back after I'd woken up in hospital. And then it's just been, a, it was a 10 year recovery period wow. um, from the injuries I sustained. And I'm just sorry to interrupt, what, what, what were those injuries? Um, well, I'd got full thickness burns. So I had no skin on my, some of my legs, parts of my legs, uh, my hands. I'm completely grafted. And I lost my face from my top lip upwards. Wow. There, there was just no skin. But I was very lucky in as much as um, there was a plastic surgeon on call for the NHS on the day that the crash happened, uh, Nick Percival. And he happened to be allocated me as his patient. Um, and it was him that grafted me and made sure that the outcome was as good as he could possibly get it. And for that, I'm eternally grateful to him. And it was his idea, actually, to put me into the hard plastic mask, which is how the public got to know me um, afterwards. I had to wear that mask for two years afterwards, which was, uh, it was, a. Uh, it took a lot of getting used to, but actually once it came off after two years, it was a bit weird. I felt, <laughs> I, I sort of got used to it. Well, you didn't feel things like wind or rain on your face <laughs> when you're outside. So it's a bit odd. Um, my hands, I had to, they took longer 
And even now, I don't have much feeling in this right hand, but the doctors all turned around and said, because of the extent of the injuries, because I, I didn't have any knuckles, um, I couldn't bend my hands like that. They were stuck. And they had to, the physiotherapy involved somebody sitting there and bending each joint and the pain. Oh, my God. I can still remember the pain to this day. Oh. Um, to get my hands working. And when the doctor said, you're, if you're lucky, you'll get 50% usage back. Um, just the type of person I am, I went, that's not good enough. Mm. So um, I kept on working at it. I got 95% usage back in this one and about 80 back in this one. Yeah. So, um, but I, th- I think I realized while I was in hospital, how much you use your hands. Um, mm. Everyone thinks it's about the face. And yes, I am happy with the face I've got now. Well, actually, can I quickly just interject there, just because for anybody who's watching on the podcast, uh, you may be expecting to see someone with horrific scar injuries. <laughs> now, I'm not just saying this to be polite, but your face looks perfect. Like that's, that's the truth. That's the truth. Um, so they've done an incredible job. How, I mean, I, the first question I've got is, how on earth did they do that? If you had no skin on your face, well, where did that come they, from? They, <laughs> they basically took the skin from the tops of my legs, which weren't burnt, and my buttock. <laughs> okay. Wow. So you've so got a bum on your face. I do have a bum face. That's yeah, quite absolutely. a unique thing to say <laughs> after a couple of pints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, although hopefully my face doesn't look like a bum. It's all I can it say. It doesn't. It definitely doesn't. <laughs> But actually, because I have to wear um, a special form of makeup, okay. it's called, ca- I mean, it's camouflage makeup. Well, you've had Katie Price on your show. Yeah. And she and I got to know each other when she was facing having to wear the mask. So, oh, you're family- thinking of Katie Piper. Oh, am I? Oh, I'm getting confused. <laughs> yeah, Katie, pa- Katie Price is the glamour model. Katie Piper. Yeah. Sorry. Apologies to Katie Piper. I was actually going to say this. She reminds you, you. It's a weird sort of way of putting it, but you're kind of the original of Katie Piper, you know, because Katie Piper <laughs> was the the modern scar victim that I think a lot of people heard of globally and watched her journey very inspirational. I guess she was the one that happened a decade before that was equally, you know, on that journey that you know people, well, yeah, now might younger people may may, may think of. Katie, whereas people are sort of decade older, will think of you, you know? Possibly, although I must admit to you, Lewis, um, I'm not, when I was in the public eye, I didn't enjoy the experience. I'm not one to look for fame or notoriety or anything like that. So to be honest, once I could drop out of the media eye, I did, and I've stayed out. The only time I think I would pop up in the public perception again is if the railways were becoming unsafe. Because I think people, for me, if I've got something to say and I think it's important enough or other people's lives are being put in danger, I would stand up in public again. Mm -hmm. However, as long as that's not going on, then I'm quite happy being, you know, a quiet, private person. Um, And... That's interesting because, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your website here and it says one of the UK's most renowned female inspirational speakers. So yeah. how, how, how can those two uh, two things coincide with one another? It's, it's because it's not media. Right, it's the I, media specifically rather than, okay. Gonna, yeah, I, I, I suppose I'm, I'm media shy. I, I don't like the attention that way. Um, apart from which I do remember when I was, because I was in the media eye for almost five years, and towards the end, I noticed how the media can turn against you or begin to, to, to turn. Mm. So well, I didn't like enjoy it. And things have moved on so much. I mean, I've watched how things have developed. It's far more in your face. It's far more there 24 hours a day. And there is this unfortunate need sometimes for the... For, I'm not tarnishing all journalists like this, but... They seem to build somebody up purely to then tear them down, mm. which doesn't sit right with me. So um, 
I stay out of it. But the, the speaking side, yeah, no, I love that because I'm getting to meet genuine people. I'm getting to listen to their stories. Yeah. And I tend to be one of these speakers. I turn up and I like to mix with them before and afterwards. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing what people have overcome, got through, facing. Yeah. Um, and sometimes <clears throat> that that sort of helps you as the inspirational speaker to then keep going because you think, okay, yes, I've got a slightly more unusual story, but I don't mind sharing it with you. So mm -hmm. that's the way I view it. Yeah, I got it. So you 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 want to inspire. You're quite happy to be on that platform if it's there to to help, but you don't want to be. I couldn't agree more with the media. You know, I think they like to get a story. And in its early days, the inspirational element is enough to get the clicks and get the headlines. But then as that part starts to die down, they need to get more creative with the ways in which they capture the public's attention. And it's actually, um, for you to have caught on to that 20 years ago is uh, quite impressive. Because it's only sort of nowadays when people are becoming more aware of the fact that they're influenced and uh, manipulated and all sorts of things by by the media um to have realized that 20 years ago and sort of lay your own path in the way that is you know congruent with the way that you want to be portrayed shows a lot of foresight actually so well i done. always meant i always remember actually the um that program had first started i don't watch much reality tv as you might have guessed um that one where they go in the jungle and then oh, celebrity get me out of it that's the one that's the one that katie price was on <laughs> <laughs> yeah price piper price yeah. piper. i must remember that um i got approached to be on there went back in the oh, wow. in the day at that time the media knew i was writing a book uh, uh, my autobiography so they said oh you can get you can come on and, and stuff and when my agent at the time brought it to me i just went no <laughs> really? <laughs> simply because i don't know i i spent Again, it comes down to personality. That has just never interested me, that sort of notoriety. Yes, you might be able to make money from it and stuff like that. But given my second chance at life, I became, um, because my vocal cords got burnt, I couldn't speak for months because nobody understood. There was no sound coming out, which is also why I keep dipping down for a sip of water because they're, um, they're still scarred. Um, but I'd already been lying there thinking, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? And it certainly was not, in my view for myself, selling my soul to make a quick buck. Mm. I'd rather find other ways of fulfilling my life because I want to get to the second time I face death, be able to be looking back on my life and then going, yep, that was fun and I made a difference. Mm. That's really what I want to do. Yeah, so you wanted to say, I'm glad I wrote that book and stood on that stage rather than swallowed that kangaroo testicle. Then... Yes, nice <laughs> way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, that makes okay. a lot of sense. I would be quite up for eating <laughs> kangaroo's testicle, I think. I think the, the reason why I would do something like that is I, I actually find that stuff quite fun. Um, but also, I've, I have a, I do have a bit of a desire for that fame, I must admit, just to be honest with it. Yeah. I was from a younger, when I was younger, I, I used to be really into acting and singing and dancing. And I've always had that kind of entertainer kind of like uh, desire in me. Mm -hmm. um, There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with it. If, if that's your personality, then go for it. And I always celebrate people's successes. You know, I think it's wonderful if they achieve what they want to achieve. It's just for me it wasn't something i was looking yeah. for i i feel i've got a different path to tread of course of course well tell us about that different path because i'm really curious to hear the turnaround so you've obviously you're in a position where well actually i'll tell you what first of all can you tell me a little bit about how you must have felt at that time when you realized your life was never going to be the same again um and that transition and that turmoil mentally of what you were going through because obviously there's the event there's the initial shock of holy yeah and then there's a transition and then there's the kind of you know your second attempt at life like you said or not attempt or second chance of life and you built an incredible one looking forward to hearing every chapter of that journey 
but yeah, what, what was it initially like? You know, when I guess when you looked in the mirror, I guess when you you, you were told, you know, what happened. How was that? You've kindly said that my face looks great. Yeah. Um, this is not the face I grew up with for thirty years. Um, it is a different face, but right. I've got used to it now. So yes, it was a shock. You're absolutely right, and it began began to dawn on me that in that split second when those two trains collided, my life was over. Everything I'd worked for was gone. There was no physical way I could go back to my company. I can't now do a normal job. I can't work nine to five for five days a week because my health is just not good enough. Mm -hmm. So my health dictates, and I struggled. I really did struggle with it. And without realizing, because by the time I recovered enough in hospital to pay attention to what had happened, how it had affected me, and think about the future, all the help and support that the government had brought in after the train crash had disappeared. There was none. So I'm afraid I went down the route of um, alcohol. I'm always embarrassed when I start to look back on this spell. And I, it, luckily it did turn into just a spell, but it was a good couple of years I was using alcohol to anaesthetize the feelings. Um, it got to the stage where when I woke up in the morning, I needed a drink to get going. And then I didn't realize the damage I was doing around me because by mid morning I was drunk, but I was still in the public eye. Um, so I was making a complete fool of myself. My family were trying to tell me, but of course, um, we well, all probably understand this, that you become very aggressive when you drink. So I was just saying, oh, you don't understand what I'm going through and all this sort of stuff. Well, they can't. And if you don't mind me quickly just jumping in. No, of course not. I, I don't, you said, oh, you know, kind of embarrassed and unfortunate I went down this route. Do you know what? I see alcohol playing a required part in your journey. Like you needed a coping mechanism of some kind. And that was the one that you found. And mm. it got you to the next stage, regardless. It, there, there could have been an alternative. There might have been a more constructive one. But regardless of whether it was positive or negative in your eyes or other people's, you are where you are today. And that was a that was a coping mechanism that you that you that you needed. Um, but I would no, you see, this is where I, I will disagree slightly because okay. yes, I understand what you're saying in so much as it is something when you're trying to sort yourself out. Um, it is an easy route to follow or an easy role, route to go down. Mm -hmm. What I wouldn't be here if it weren't for eventually getting psychological help because my alcoholism actually culminated in me trying to commit suicide. Right. Um, so that is the downside. That is where I could have ended my life again. I think it was more, looking back, I think it was more call for help because I, I, I just was totally out of control. But then a psychologist stepped in and he, he's he been with me now for 15 years. So, and I still consult a psychologist because I got diagnosed then with post-traumatic stress disorder. Understandably, nobody told me before you there was such a thing, yeah. but because the trauma hadn't been dealt with at the time of the crash or soon after, I've now got it chronically, which means it, it'll be with me forever. Do you go on trains? I forced myself to go on trains. So yes, I do. I do catch the train. I've always turned around because the rail industry knew when I caught the first train. Mm. <laughs> it's funny, actually, I felt a bit like the Queen must have felt um, because I caught a very short journey, but the rail industry knew about it. And I was turned up at Slough Station in the southeast, and they were busily painting the platform and stuff and they All gave right. me a whole train to myself except i had a tv crew because um trevor mcdonald was um filming it but it was so funny because all i could smell everywhere i went was paint it was really <laughs> weird and i've never been so relieved to get from slough to paddington mm -hmm. um and i almost got down on the ground and kissed the ground but mm -hmm. 
I was then able to think in my head, I've done it. I've finished that journey that I started all those years back. And it's taken me 10 years, but now I will not allow this crash to define me anymore. Yeah. So now I catch the train back into London to uh, for meetings. And if I'm working, I don't enjoy it. I don't think I ever will enjoy mm -hmm. it. I still get flashbacks um, on the train. I have to listen to quite loud music <laughs> yeah. um, through my headphones. And I have been known to throw up, unfortunately, without reaching the um, toilet. But I think that's allowable. <laughs> I think it is. Um, but I still won't stop doing it. I've always said to, including the rail industry, everybody, if I ever turn around to you and say, I've stopped catching the train, that is not my fear. That is because there is something desperately wrong with with the trains that were running. Mm. Uh, but after the suit, it wasn't just a psychological help because I'm lucky enough to have a friend called Simon Weston, who people may remember as the Falklands war hero. He and I spoke when I was coming out of my alcoholism and it was him actually that really turned it around for me because he said to me, because he's been through it, and he said the thing he learned was alcohol when you are that stressed or that um, trying to cope with so much he said it can do one of two things either it will destroy you and your life in the end or you can choose not to allow it to destroy you to turn your back on it and i went from simon's house back to mine and i tipped every single bit of alcohol down the sink and from there on in I, I mean, now I do drink socially when I'm out with friends, I'll have one or two, but I'm very careful mm -hmm. and I don't have alcohol in the house. Again, I am being careful. That's because I want to be in control. I don't want it to yeah. ever take control of my life again. Yeah. Just going back to something you said earlier, which was really interesting it was mm -hmm. a while back, but it's something that stuck in my mind and I wanted to ask you about it. You mentioned that when you looked in the mirror, you had a different face. It wasn't... Mm -hmm that you you know remembered you know pre pre the crash did that create can only imagine a bit of an identity crisis as well in terms of who am i now was that something that that came up you know with that or was it just literally just getting used to different persona well not even different persona that would have been the identity but just getting used to a different skin i don't know whether this is right or wrong i'll have to ask my psychologist but to me i I accepted this, my face, because I don't have to look at it all the time. It's pe it's people, other people have to look at it. Okay. I don't. And most people I meet won't remember the old face because nobody paid me any attention back then, apart from um, my various husbands. Um, mm. But so for me, I'm always looking outwards yeah. out of my face. I have, I do realize that I don't often look in the mirror. I will put my face on, obviously, and be staring in a mirror. And I don't avoid mirrors at all, but it doesn't occur to me to go and check my makeup or make sure my lipstick's on, mm. um, simply because it's not quite my face that's staring back at me. Mm. So I, I don't know, I think it's, it's a truce I've called with my face. Okay. So. Does that mean I fully accepted it? I don't know. But one thing I am interested in, where I'm grafted from here upwards, apparently grafts don't wrinkle. <laughs> yeah, I've heard this. So you don't age. But where I clapped my hands over my eyes, which luckily saved my eyesight, I didn't get burnt round here. So I think, and I'm not sure, when I hit my 60s and 70s, these will wrinkle and this will wrinkle, but this will be completely smooth. So I'm going to end up looking like a tortoise. That is what I'm going to be left with. So you've got another part of your journey to anticipate yet. Another reverse <laughs> to overcome. You've got a tortoise life coming up. Yeah, I'm intrigued now to see whether I do turn into a, a terrapin or a tortoise when I'm in my um, I'm final sure you, years. I'm sure if you really needed to, um, some of your cosmetic buddies that have known you for decades would be like let's give you a little eye lift and a little neck <laughs> or whatever it's called and sort you out i'm sure you'll be fine 
<laughs> so tell us about okay so we we discussed sort of briefly but not as as extensively as i would have imagined so let's dive a little bit deeper so yeah back to how you felt when it happened you know i still don't really feel like i've got an essence of that moment where you realize your life has changed and you know you're not the same person anymore i mean you said you you said you went into alcohol uh, so we understand kind of what you were using to cope with that feeling but what was that feeling what was what was going on for you because there'll be people out there right now that have that feeling and they're in that place i'd love for them to identify with you yeah. and then hear what happens after and know that you know they can do the same so I'm sorry if that's triggering, by the way. And let no, me know no, not at all. Me. No, because you're right. Because sometimes, because um, I tend to deal with things as strongly as I can, I, I sometimes don't go deep enough. It was yeah. the same with the book. The first draft, the publisher turned around and said, you're writing it in the third person. So I then had to start again and actually dig deep. So no, you're absolutely right. It was grief. It was a form of bereavement my previous life i mean when i look back i've got a much better life now than i had then however i didn't know that at that time mm. it was a life that i had built for myself i was going on five star holidays i was traveling first class i mean i had all the trappings that come with a bit of wealth when you run your own company and it's successful but i think initially i wanted that back i wanted to have exactly what I had before, because it had not been my fault. Mm -hmm. I did not go out and set myself a light. I wanted justice. But I think deep down, I knew if I got angry and then kept on reaching backwards to what I wanted or used to have, that somehow it was going to do uh, make things a heck of a lot worse for myself. Absolutely. Um, Maybe that's why the alcohol came in, because when you've had a few, you're much uh, like you cry. It's much easier to cry, isn't it? And it's um, much easier to come out with all this gobbledygook that's going on inside of you. Maybe release. Yeah. Yeah. And you're completely right, by the way. When I was in rehab, I learned the expression resentments keep you sick. And it's if you hold on to that, any person you're really damaging is yourself. You know, you you. you and also the serenity prayer. I, I think I've said this on every single podcast, but have you heard the serenity prayer before? I don't think so, no. All right. It's called, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Now you've heard it. The courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And that kind of links up with the resentments keep you sick because a lot of people hold on to these resentments thinking that if they're angry about it for as much as they can, that it will change mm. the situation. Yeah. Once you realise that nothing can change that situation, and regardless of how angry I am about it, it's not going to make any bit, bit of difference. Mm -hmm. The question is, do I want to be angry or not? And who's that serving? Uh, and I've been in situations where I've been resentful at something or someone, and in a, in, a, in a weird sort of walked way, it kind of feels like we're getting one back at them or that situation by being resentful, isn't it? I, I don't know if you relate to that. It's like, yeah. if I'm angry at them, then... They deserve me to be angry at them, you know? And But really, in reality, that thing or that person has no idea of that resentment that you're holding on or doesn't care and is walking around happy as Larry or, you know, the, you know, it's, it's obviously different in everyone's scenario, but the only person that's really hurting is yourself through that resentment. So realising yeah. is important. Yeah, don't, don't you also think that when you get to that stage where you can almost physically do that to whatever it is and put it in your past and then concentrate on moving that way forward. Um, that to me is really empowering. Of course. It's, it's, it's where you've, you've grabbed something that is so powerful by just letting go and letting that well, become the past. You may never forget it, um, particularly when it has been very traumatic within your life. But you you just make that decision, don't you? I will no longer allow you, that to affect me. And my power, or even, even if you were looking for revenge, which I never did, but if you did want to get your own back on someone, something, 
what better way of getting your own back to become that powerful person mm. that then said, you know, that is definitely in my past. I'm going that way. And that way is quite exciting to me. See, I have to get tingly when I do this, you know, when I actually feel that moving forward. Mm. Um, that to me is where we all should be heading, you know, irrespective of whether you've got something to push into the past or not. Yeah. Um, and that's what I keep trying to do when I'm talking to people is to get that. I'm literally fizzing with excitement every time I think forward. Um, and that's what I'm trying to get other people to feel. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, I couldn't agree more. I, I had some traumas with my father and stuff like that. And, you know, I was angry at him for a long time. There's probably still elements of that there still to this day. I don't think you 100% get rid of it, no. um, but I'm not holding on to it. And I've let it go. Um, but I've decided to, because just to give you some context, he used to call me a buffoon and stupid and stuff like that and hit me and things like that. And I, you know, that stuck with me. And my sort of, I guess, revenge, rather than revenge, is look who I've become, you know? Yeah. And who, look, you know, am I stupid now? You know? And the kind of, you know, f but not in a bitter, yeah. not yeah. In, in an empowering way, in a look what I've been able to do, Dad. You know, and unfortunately, you know, he he's not around, you know, and that makes it a bit more difficult because he passed away. And same with you, it's difficult, to, I guess, to find that person to show, isn't there? Uh, so I don't know, is, is there is there a way that, I mean, I'm sort of deviating now a little bit. And I, and I always use these podcasts a little bit for myself as well, because I sometimes find it difficult. Because I'd love to be able to, I'd love to be able to sit, sit down with my dad and say, told you, I'm not stupid, but I can't. So there's a little bit of an unclosed loop there that I'm still working on. Um, do you resonate with that at all? Or have you been able to work through that in any way? Is, is there someone or something that you've been able to kind of close a loop on? It's a quite a profound question, though. <laughs> Feel free to take some time to think. The only person that I was um, at loggerheads with for most of my adult life was my mother. Right. Um, she's passed as well. She passed a few years back. However, when the when the book when I my book got published, I thought, oh, I better tell my mum because I write about my childhood in there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I sent her a copy to read, and the next thing I knew. <laughs> was I got an email from her and it was vicious. It was um, threatening me with legal action, all sorts of stuff, painting her as a bad mother, all the, oh, geez. So um, I did get the opportunity to say to her, and I, I was the one that remained calm. I phoned her and I said to her, look, um, I'll come to your apartment, get rid of your husband, make sure we're alone. I will spend all day with you and we can thrash it out. And we did. We you had don't need a fist fight, do you? No, I mean, <laughs> to be well, honest, I went. I went there to listen to her, and then the more she was saying, "How dare you talk about that? That's my life." I was saying, "Well, actually, no. I'm talking about it from my perspective." Hmm. And book. It, yeah, exactly. So, and in the end, we did sort it out. We. Hmm. Um, I don't think she was ever very happy about it, but we then became extremely Amazon. good friends. So she survived for about 10 years after that. And yeah, we were very loving and all that in a way is slightly regretful because we could have had that so many years earlier. But I think most families will have a mother or a father or a, um, I mean, what your father did is just blatantly wrong. I mean, if you call somebody buffoon or stupid enough, they're going to start believing it, particularly mm. when they're a child. So that was wrong. But hopefully, I mean, if there is something in spiritualism that's there, maybe your father has seen you make a success of yourself and that you are successful now. So he was wrong. Uh, part of me probably still thinks he'd go, ah, oh, still. <laughs> it's still in there. It's, I honestly, I've still got some work to do. It's, it's an ever evolving process, isn't it? Personal development. Like you say, you're still, you know, with your your saying. Did you refer to them as a consultant? So my psychologist. Psychologist. So yeah. So you're still with them now. Tw Twenty one years later, did you say? No, we've been. Uh, he's been my psychologist for fifteen. 
Exactly. So I think a lot of people seem to think that you can become cured. And in some aspects, yes, you know, we can we can reverse some of these symptoms and and and, and live a great life. But that doesn't mean to say that, you know, you, you know, you can live happily ever after. There's constant work that needs to be done. And not just out of necessity, but out of um desire to learn more about yourself and be happier and to release more and more and you know be freer and freer as we go ahead whether it's needed or not you know and that's why obviously i'm a big advocate for coaching because coaching isn't necessarily about traumatic well it's not about traumatic events it's not about the past it's about the future it's about who are you who can you become what do you want to achieve what's holding you back you know and that's a, a lifetime learning process that never never ends <laughs> So let's go back to because something you were saying when you were you tingling and you was like I I love to share that you can I'm just trying to remember the things you were saying you put things away um, move on from them and look to the future that was a is that was that a, a good summary yeah exactly. yeah so this is going to be a hard question and I think because you was like this is what I really want to share with people so I I sense there's a frustration of being able to articulate it because it's a very, very personal thing and also a very difficult thing to explain. But can you? How do you do that? If someone is in a situation where they're, they are resentful, they are bitter, they are angry, they are still in that stage of uh, grief and they can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, they don't believe that there is that possibility of an asset at the end because their life, you know, as far as they're concerned, regardless of the level of severity to them is, you know, it might be a breakup, for example. Yeah. I, I talk about this. One of my deepest traumas I've had, and I've had sexual abuse, so I've walked in, found my dad there, you know. I've had all sorts of things, right? But one of my deepest traumas com comes from just splitting up with my first girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> because it just that's the one that hit me the most. So everyone has different levels of perspective, trauma, yeah. and what the end of the road is for them and their darkest moment. For example, your alcohol addiction seems to be something that you really, you know, re regret in a sense. Like I get that that vibe, but I see that as an, em an empowering sort of part of your journey and a step that needed to be taken in order to be. Yeah, I think I think I'm just more embarrassed about it because I made such an excuse language, but I made an yeah. ass of myself back then. Oh. Well. <laughs> I'm the same. At least you didn't take cocaine and do all the go to prison like I did. So you did a quite a good job of holding it in to be fair. I think alcohol was probably the best, one of the best, the better solutions you could have used. But it got you, it got you through. That's the thing. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It got you through. Mm. Um, you didn't continue to use it. And it wasn't like, you know, so yeah, there could have been better ways. And then ideally I didn't go to prison and I didn't punch people's heads in and stuff like that. But I'm here where I am, and as a result yourself and I have, have impacted millions of people and if we hadn't have done those things we might not have uh, we might not be here today doing things we're doing so anyway I spoke way too long there <laughs> you 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 want to help people uh, or you love helping people let go of the past look to the future move on how do they do that and that's a different <laughs> question but can you try and explain it <laughs> <laughs> well i mean this is what i try to do it's really it is quite hard but i understand why it's hard it's quite hard it's it's very hard it's very hard okay yeah. it's very hard but i do understand see with our different ex yours and my experience very different yeah however it was enough to push us out of how we've been conditioned to grow up mm -hmm. so life expects or life society expects us to follow a certain route and if we deviate that route we either become a criminal or we're a victim or something anyway for whatever reason you and i got knocked off and we're now creating our own path which we know is exciting and we know what then opens up in front of you you can almost pick and choose which direction you want to go mm. in and how you want to be successful. Passing that on to people that are still within that um, wow. conformity and conditioning, it's really difficult to just get them to raise their heads. However, mm. my biggest high now is when I'm giving a talk and I watch people's eyes because I find I, I can 
I come across better if I'm looking at people, um, which is why lockdown did not help because I could not see those little people's eyes. Mm. Um, I prefer doing it physically, but when you see a spark go off in yeah, somebody's eyes, yes, that's when you think, yes, I've just reached somebody. Well, you, now just what I'm you, you, say. you just you just got me a second ago. Can I before we get move on? Can we just address it because I've never thought of it that way. But what you're saying is almost when someone's received such some sort of traumatic trauma, it's almost like congratulations, you just snapped out the matrix. Yeah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the real world. Yeah. What do you want to do next? Like, what a different way of looking at it. That's a, I that's have a I've way. written about I've written in my blog about this that we are all when we're born um it's a terrible way to look at it but if you consider that life is normal life is black and white you yeah. and i and people like us we've suddenly become technicolor mm. so people don't understand quite how to handle us all yeah. the time and that, but that's also why we quite often end up doing what we are now doing which is we're going out and we're talking to people and we're facing people and we've got audiences and but that just shows that there is a hunger for what we've got, but yeah. we wouldn't want anyone to go through the trauma that we went to get there. No. Well, they probably have, but they, they don't know how to get to the other side. Pain to power is what's coming up for me. I talk about adversity into an asset, but actually this one feels a little bit more like pain into power. It's almost like you become superhuman when you're able to... <laughs> And really okay. realize you know what the world is about and you you don't get the luxury of having that perspective shift and that wake-up call until you have something so so dramatic happen you know um so i love that so i'm gonna be stealing that and using that <laughs> <laughs> so we okay so we've spoken about the sort of that was how you were able to, to to turn your adversity into an asset and sort of see some light at the end of the tunnel. So when, when was it that you started to go, okay, so I'm now going to move forward with my life. And what was that? What were those first, what did those first steps look like? Was it like, I'm going to get myself in front of the camera? Was it, I'm going to write the book? What was the, what was the bit that started the asset, you know, the assets that you have today in terms of, you know, the, the ability to help people and the, the income that comes from it and the books that you've written, the stages that you've spoken on, how did you get into that? Because that's the bit that I guess a lot of people are going to be inspired by. I'll be perfectly up by accident. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if I believe in accident. Uh, maybe maybe the train accident, but not these types of accidents. No, it was, um, yeah, well, this is also why I can hand on heart, that is the right side, isn't it? Um, honestly say that now I... I'm not negating the pain and suffering that that train crash caused a lot of families, but the train crash is actually the best thing to have ever happen to me. You know what? I, I, I find that incredible. And sorry to just interrupt, but just when you yeah. say something like that, it needs to be highlighted, you know, because I've never heard somebody not say that. It's incredible. It Like someone you know, that's experienced the worst things that can ever, you know, for, for example, we had... Um, Richard McCann, you know Richard McCann? Is I know Richard very yeah. well, yeah. And he again says like, you know, how, how can, it's difficult to be able to even, you know, say that publicly, you know, the fact that my mum was murdered, you know, mm. and, and his sister committed suicide, but all of these things have, you know, turned me into the person I am and they're the best things that ever happened to me. And it's, it's incredibly um, bold and brave to be able to even admit that, but to actually, um, it's just incredible. And it's not just one person that said it that makes it a coincidence. A lot of us have. Yeah. And that's why I think it's so powerful because it, it creates even more of this compounding effect for people listening. But we're not talking. No. <laughs> you know, it's not like really we're sitting there drinking whiskey and then we're like, yeah, I've got a podcast to do this, pretend to be positive again. It's, it's really life changing wow i'm so glad this happened otherwise my life would have, you would have you would have probably just been that corporate woman that ended up you know working exactly. her whole life and getting exactly. a pension and that one, it? it's not as if, if if you if you had a magic marker and could go back and stop that traumatic whatever happening mm. you you might do yeah um, but we can't we we live in reality so i've always had this attitude of if i can't change it 
fine. I'll just have to work out a way to accept it. I'll just yeah. get on with it. Um, but <laughs> yeah, t- taking it from the point of view of what you could have been had that trauma not happened. Yes, you would just be an older version of what I was before. I don't like the person I was before. I don't want that person back. Right. Do you I believe like you are a better, better person as well? Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. And what, and what do you think created that, the, the humility and stuff that, that came with, I guess, your journey? The realisation, I suppose, with what happened, that life's over like that. And, just, um, yeah. and I mean, beforehand, my family were lucky to see me once a year, if that. Um, whereas now family and friends come first. I don't care what I'm doing or where I am in the world. If my family or my close friends need me, I'm there. I don't ask questions. Um, so, and all, all the stuff like back then it was all, because that was Margaret Thatcher's era. Um, it was all money, 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 even worse than today. You'd sell your own grandmother to make money. Um, whereas now money's not so important. I mean, yeah, you want to pay your bills and your mortgage and stuff like that, but no, I do not need the latest car. No, I do not need to go on a posh holiday. Insta- can't afford it. Instagram followers now, I think. Sorry? <laughs> Instagram followers the people want, I think. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so I just think it's, and I'm more open to other people. Um, I was explaining when we first started this interview that I've just moved. I've moved from the southeast of England um, up to North Wales, and it's much quieter up here. I'm surrounded by hills and valleys. I've only got four neighbours. Um, Let's hope they're nice. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, luckily, they are they, all they very four nice. four horrible neighbours. They're going to be very different. Um, but I'm loving it, and I'm loving going out and meeting people and listening to their stories and what they've been up to and um, realising it's all part of... The world is so much bigger than we give it credit for. Mm. And it's another thing, pre-COVID, I'm just, I'm actually just restarting at the moment, but pre-COVID, you would not have caught me in this country in February. I was always travelling abroad and I would take three to four weeks. I would go to a country, I would hire a car or um, I didn't catch their trains, I have to admit, and I would hire locals to be my tour guides and stuff. And I would just immerse myself into the culture and the feeling of that country and then come back to Britain to pick up where I'd left off and carry on with what I was doing. But it was so enriching each time to pick up on what other people saw, felt, believed, Mm. were into. And you sort of bring that back and you build it into your life and the way that you're looking at this. And that to me is, that's where all this Technicolor is continually coming from. Yeah, and that's such a that's such a good valid point. You know, that we haven't touched on any other podcasts. Is you know they say traveling broadens the mind. That is one hundred percent true, isn't it? Because yeah. you speak you speak about this conditioning and this societal uh, creation of this person, and it typically become you know it comes from their surroundings, right? So we're just absorbing what we know, and we that's our truth, and that's what we believe, and. You know, the the more localized you are, the smaller the opportunity is, and the larger the limitations are. So, if you're born in like this small village, you're going to be like every other person in that village. You know, yeah. if you're born in a, in a city, maybe you've got a little bit more opportunity. But if you travel the world, you're like, oh my god, there's people doing that. There's people doing, yeah. that. People doing that, and it's just like, oh my god, I can do whatever I want. You know. Um, so I couldn't agree more. That is a very a big, valuable takeaway. I mean, not not everyone's going to be able to afford to travel, but now that we do have the virtual world, there's mm-hmm. no reason why you can't get into conversations with people. One of the conversations I've yet to have, but it's still bubbling away in my head, is I've never understood from history why the... I, I don't have any religion, I hasten to add, but why the Jewish people have such a hard time throughout history they they've continually been persecuted and picked on and and just everywhere just all the time even back to medieval times they were being pushed out of countries back then and i keep thinking to myself i must find a rabbi to sit down and say can you please explain the history of 
your culture and where mm. you're being. And it's not because I want to be Jewish or I'm just curious. I'm, I'm well, just... It's filling up, fill another gap in your mind and add yeah. another colour to your palette. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, one of my favourite conversations was um, in Sri Lanka, because of course, 90% of that population are Buddhists. And I'm not a Buddhist, but I do like the fact it's more of a way of life than it is a faith. But I sat down for a whole afternoon talking to, um, they call them venerable sirs, um, so a priest, if you like, in Buddhism, and finding out about what makes Buddhists tick and what, what do they believe in and stuff. And as I said, it hasn't made me come away going, oh, I'm now a Buddhist, but it has made me look at things for how I'm behaving with other people in a very different light. So, yeah, everything everything sort of sticks to you, doesn't it? Yeah. It sort of... Well, the way I see religion is it's just a, a, a sort of set of principles and ethics and morals to live your life by. And they're all kind of different versions of the same thing. Like I would identify with being an agnostic. I don't know if you've, you've heard of that. Term, mm -hmm. but it's yeah. like somebody who believes in something but has no idea what that is. Yeah. I don't necessarily believe in all of the traditions. Like I don't, I don't really believe that Jesus turned, you know, Right. He's probably a very nice man. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think he turned uh, water into wine. And also, when you're in Bali and you see them, you know, going down the road with their big dragons banging their drum and things, I think is this actually necessary? <laughs> like, <laughs> some of this has got to be wrong. So, but but there are teachings and there are lessons and there are things we can learn in in all of these religions. And it doesn't necessarily need to be something you, you practice, but there's something okay. that you acknowledge and use to your advantage to become a better person and and you've yeah, and i've always said i i've never minded people's faiths in as much as if it brings them comfort and it helps them in their journey and their path because we're all different then good on you carry on amazing so i'd like you to do me a favor and blow your own trumpet a little bit so since I mean, you speak about you know the, the the accident being the best thing that's ever happened to you, uh, you got a life you know that it was better than it would have been. Traveling has been, by the sounds of it, one of those things. And actually, quickly before we dive into this, I just want to mention, just want to do a little plug here. The business we do at the Coaching Masters is we help people build freedom-based online coaching businesses. That's actually what we do. Our mission is to provide ordinary people with extraordinary tools to create freedom for themselves and others. And what we do is we teach them tools and techniques and the models and the frameworks of coaching. And then we teach them the online business skills to have a remote working coaching business where they can do from anywhere in the world. So we have coaches from 81 countries around the world and they're traveling nomadically and they live in Bali and they, you know, they go wherever they like. Uh -huh. so they can travel whilst helping people, whilst earning an income. So it is actually now possible for anybody to do it. So I just wanted to just... Give that plug because, um, yeah, if someone's listening to this, like, wow, I'd love to be able to travel, but I don't have the resources. There are ways to do that now. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we need to show your assets. So can you do me a favor and blow your trumpet? What else have you achieved? I mean, we mentioned the book. I mean, you know, share with me the amazing things and the assets that you've been able to acquire and create and help people over the last few years. Okay. Um, well, I managed to help changed the UK's railway system. Wow. Yeah. Um, because I just became a bee in the rail industry's bonnet. They yeah. really hate me. Uh, so back in the day, I campaigned very hard and very publicly, um, holding the government and the rail industry to account for what had happened, not just to us, Southall, Clapham, what came after us, Potter's Bar, um, I kept on pulling them up and not letting them off the hook and um, getting them in the public eye to show them up. And eventually we had an inquiry after our train crash, which came up with a whole raft of recommendations to improve safety. And by the time I dropped out of the public eye and stopped campaigning, um, we'd managed to get 93% of them implemented. Um, which is unusual for an inquiry to have somebody persistently pushing. Even now, ever since I started catching the trains again, I'm still in the background with the rail companies. <clears throat> I'm on the rail safety committee uh, for the country 
quietly just keeping an eye on safety and stuff. This is why I'm saying if I stop catching the train, take it seriously. Um, okay, I'll take a note of that. <laughs> but uh, so that I'm quite proud of. I, that I will be eternally proud that I managed to change something, little old me. Um, and I'm continuing to keep an eye on it. So there's that. The writing of the book was just something that I wanted to do and get done. So it's quite nice to be able to say I'm a published author as well as an inspirational speaker. But one thing I have learned about myself in these intervening years is I get bored really quickly. Yes. So I can't do one thing. It's not in my nature. Um, and there are times when I follow a path and then I go, oops, or, oh my God, I really don't dislike this. But now, because of this technical and new life I've got, I just shut it down and and you know go go a different way or find something new to do. So um, there's other things I've got my fingers into at the moment, which is still at the early stages. So I'm not prepared to discuss them, which is quite. Good. Aww, you can't leave <laughs> like that. I can't just be curious. One. <laughs> um, well, I'm thinking. Or I've been asked to think about potentially becoming a voiceover. Okay, cool. Because I love when Barack Obama started doing the. Um, did you see that he did? He did some like um, Barack Obama is the voiceover of a nature, uh, world documentary, a bit like uh, David Attenborough. Oh right, I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, I'm relating you to Barack Obama right now. But um, well, I'm, I'm quite. Impressed. Thank you so much. No, I was thinking more about corporate videos and stuff like right, that. Okay. <laughs> but oh, I'd love to have a voice like Morgan Freeman. Yeah. Do you know that man's voice? Yeah. It just turns my knees to water. It really, really? does. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, when things pop up in front of me, I go off and investigate. Mm. And if I quite like the look of it, then I'll have a go. And I'm not always that good. Um, interesting, isn't it? That's, that's quite. It's, a, it's an interesting thing to pop up, considering facial being a big part of your journey and almost like the voice. There's something strange about that. Not strange in a bad way, but just something interesting. How that? Do, do, do you understand? There's like a dynamic there that's that's interesting. No, no I, I was just talking to somebody, then spoke to somebody else about me, and then somebody else must have listened to, I don't know, my videos or whatever, um, and that it then came back up the chain and said, "Have you ever thought about voiceovering? Voice over? If I could speak, maybe." <laughs> But it's crazy though, isn't it, to, to think, because it's another asset that's completely irrelevant to your your accident. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, it's almost bizarre, isn't it? It's like, hey, there's an opportunity that's come up that's to do with nothing to do with any of the disfigurement or anything that you no longer have anyway, as far as I can see. I'm sure there is somewhere. Yeah, I just find that fascinating how these opportunities are almost presented to us and it's and they're almost unstoppable, aren't they? I sometimes feel like there's opportunities everywhere. And it, were they there before we were blinded to them? Or I don't think an, a financial advisor will be offered. Yeah. Well, I, but if you put yourself in the right space, and if you if you then, because again, I think an advantage for people who've overcome adversity is perhaps that we're quicker to spot the opportunity. So mm -hmm. something might pass somebody else by Quickly because they don't realise actually well, this. Yeah. yeah. Exactly, because, yeah, there's one thing, knowing an opportunity exists, and another thing actually being able to allow yourself to accept it. But if you've, you know, had such traumatic things happen in your life, it's just like, why not? Fuck it, you know? And really most cool. people's in instinct is to be fearful of change. Mm. So, I mean, it's one thing that I bang on about throughout all my talks is change is actually exciting. It's not something to fear. Um, but it is, I can understand why people are fearful. It's easier to stay in your comfort zone. But then if you're in your comfort zone, fine. But don't be surprised if nothing pops up for you. Don't be surprised if you're lying on your, your deathbed thinking F I wish you'd done all that stuff but that was, that was yeah, awful because I say to people often it's like risk feels scary 
but have you ever taken the time to contemplate the feeling of regret in the future? It's far worse, I should imagine. Yeah, I mean, you you probably, you just mentioned it. I mean, everyone who can do that deathbed scene in their own head yeah, um, and look back on their life, what do they want it to look like? And it's probably not what they're currently doing, which is, you know, sitting down in front of the TV and doing a job they don't like and, mm-hmm. you know, paying, paying their bills month to month with, you know, very little else going on and that's not me trying to be a, a hating on the general population but just being realistic you know i speak to people all the time you know that come into our community and that and that is their reality and that's all they think is available for them and there is no way out of that and that's life but it's down to people like us and you know anybody else who wants to get involved to share that there is an alternative and you yeah. don't necessarily need to wait for the adversity to happen you know, in order to be able to turn into an asset, you know, there is an amazing life out there for everybody, but we have to we have to go out and fight for it and find it. And uh, sometimes it's forced on us, like in our scenario, and other people get to choose. Um, are, are the people listening to this or watching this prepared to choose that life because it's available for us? But anyway, Pam, it's been an absolute pleasure. Is there anything else? I've got one last question for you, but before I do that, is there anything else that you'd like to share with with anybody listening right now that's maybe going through some tough times or and is looking for that extra boost? Yeah, I suppose don't give up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's it doesn't matter how many times you fail or you might start something and then think I'm too frightened or um it's it's a bit like that old adage isn't it when if you're trying to quit something um like say if you're a smoker and you're trying to quit cigarettes then you might suddenly start smoking again or you might have a few don't kick yourself mm-hmm. you've just got to think right okay stop doing that again move forward and it's that continual moving forward because it will gather momentum Absolutely. And knowing that that's normal as well, I think a lot of people might beat themselves up and look at people like us and go, oh, they're perfect. But there was only, it was only recently where I was, I had a, some epileptic seizures and also a chest inf- uh, infection. It was very random. And I was in Bali and they started injecting me with fentanyl, which is a hundred times stronger than wow. me. And then they were prescribing me with Valium and Xanax and Tramadol. Before you knew it, I was, I was a prescription drug addict. Like, honestly, it came out of nowhere. And I had to get myself off of those drugs. And this was only about six months ago. Well, this is, yeah, between six months to three months ago, I had about three months of taking those drugs. And um, that came out of nowhere. And I think a lot of people would probably think that, you know, people like us that, you know, have our shit together, don't go through those ups and downs and don't of make- Of course them. we do. But it's, you know, it's a part of life. So, yeah. and, and they separate, they, a lot of people separate themselves from us and they go, well that's all right for people like that but it's not for people like me but i remember feeling like that i remember i remember feeling like i was the one that was different and yeah you might be able to change and you but not people like me yeah it's available for everybody yeah so yeah can agree more thank you so much there's been a lot of value shared today last question yeah is sure. your website it says uh you know, international inspirational speaker. So I'm curious to know, what is the difference in your mind of the difference between an inspirational speaker or a motivational speaker? Okay, they're not dissimilar. I think though, when you inspire somebody, I'm gonna use dictionary definitions now, you are profoundly changing them. So an inspirational speaker is somebody who is not so much about steps or or you must do this and you must do that it's they speak to the person enough that something switches on inside that person so they profoundly change motivation is more if you think about the like right you will do it this way so it's more recipe based Mm -hmm. um and that sort of motivation if it's not partnered with inspiration um it tends to fall away so an inspirational speaker when we manage to touch people and profoundly change them that lasts them for the rest of their lives when a motivational speaker is speaking they will come up with a possibly a very good formula but unless it's then continually reinforced that will drop away from their audience after a month two months three months 
Um, so it's slightly different, but they do work very well in tandem. Mm. Um, but that's why when when clients say to me, well, what is it that, you know, you can offer me apart from just inspiration? You know, what's my return on investment? It then becomes quite hard to quantify. But mm. you're sort of saying, well, you know, this this is how your staff will or your employees will be profoundly affected. And so it has proven <laughs> now, luckily, I've got the history to then look back and say, well, you're quite welcome to speak to this client because this is what they said about me. Yeah, they, they changed in this way, which increased performance in this way, which increased revenue in this way. And that's, you know, what you're looking for. So, yeah, that completely makes sense. I guess m motivation is more sheer yeah, short lived and high energy. But like you said, it can dwindle away a bit like the Tony Robbins music pumping this in the air. But then they go back, you know, home after the two day seminar and they sit, sit back on the sofa with their wife and they're like, oh, that was fun. But now what? Yeah, you, know, you, need that, you need that fire inside, you know, to be that lit. That reminds me that I was at um, a speaker's convention in uh, Washington um, one year. And it was full of American speak. America doesn't really encourage British speakers. They seem to want to keep it to themselves. Mm. Uh, but so there was lots of American speakers on and there were a few that I went to thinking, yeah, I want to listen to them. And there's this one woman, she was on stage and she was going like this at me. Yes. And, I was saying, and I was on a WhatsApp group with the people that I was there with. And I was going, Please tell her to stop shouting at me. I don't want to be shouted at anymore. It's not one of those <laughs> seminars. Please leave. <laughs> well, at least you did a good job of motivating her by accident. Um, <laughs> both pieces of the puzzle there, both motivation and inspiration, which I'm sure are equally as uh, powerful to somebody. But we've changed my life because I'm now going to call myself an, uh, an inspirational speaker for the rest of my life and not use the motivation. <laughs> Thank you for you're that. Also, you're also going to nick some of this um, interview. I will. I will trademark it, all. it. Trademark. <laughs> Everything you've said is now in my brain for life, and I will. <laughs> I won't be able to help sharing it. I'm sorry, but uh, hopefully, I've shared a couple of bits for you as well. You can nick those Definitely. back. Definitely. It's been a pleasure, Pam. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you for having me on, Lewis. Do you let me know how you get on? Because I know you're on a bit of a mission as well. Of course. So, of course. Um, keep, keep, stay in touch and let me know how you're doing. I will do, and hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully we get a chance to meet up. Um, I'm actually due back to the UK at some point, so who knows, maybe we'll catch up in Wales over a brew one day. Yeah, sounds good to me. <laughs> cool, well, take it easy. Thank you, everybody, listening today on the Turning Your Adversity into an Asset podcast. This is me over and out, Lewis Freeman taylor uh, Take care, and, uh, yeah, go and turn those adversities into an asset, guys. It's uh, proven. We've proven it today. We've proven it every other episode. Now it's your turn. Thank <laughs> you.